It's a simple fact that old media hates new media. Desperately trying to regain whatever dominance they once had by poo-pooing whatever hot new threat is out there. Be it movies, radio, pop music, television, and obviously in the case of today's episode, video games. However, considering it's being scientifically proven multiple times that video games actually have a positive effect on people, the press have steeped to enhancing the truth to convince the mainstream, to the point of absolute absurdity. And boy, you would not believe the claims they've made over these past few years. So, this episode, we take a look at these perjurious paparazzi, these reviling reporters, and these hyperbolic hacks. As I say, but hello you. I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Fact Hunt. Three times tabloid press try to destroy video games with utter lies. One easy way for the tabloids to clickbait gullible parents is to combine their fear of death and the anxiety of narcotics with whatever popular thing the kids are into. And with the meteoric rise of Fortnite in youth culture, it was like flies to the proverbial poop for the paparazzi, all ready to brainwash parents into thinking what the younglings currently enjoyed was the devil incarnate. And no one did this better than the Daily Mirror with their headline, Fortnite made me a suicidal drug addict. The story itself is about 17-year-old Carl. The name changed to protect his identity or existence. A teenager who had become addicted to playing a popular battle royale game all night and taking speed to keep awake in the daytime. This cycle depressed him so much he wanted to take his own life by jumping out of his third-story bedroom window being caught just in time by his father. Now, this is all typical tabloid bashing. However, the cracks begin to appear when Carl starts giving contradicting comments, like, each time you're killed, you're automatically dropped into the battle zone, which to anyone who's played a battle royale game will know isn't true. You're kicked back to the main menu and have to actively choose to start a new game. Also, the more battles you win, the more you want to keep playing. Again, unless you're exceptionally good, winning in the game is rare. And the biggest giveaway of all, being Cole claiming he started to steal from his parents, another tabloid trope, so he could buy the latest weapons and upgrades in the game. You never actually buy weapons in Fortnite, you find them scattered within the game itself. You know... It's almost as if Carl has no concept of how Battle Royale games work. Hmm. Let's keep that thought in mind. The story also ups the ante, with Carl claiming his friends recommend he change from speed to amphetamines to keep him awake. And somehow Fortnite is also to blame for this too, and not the fact he has really shitty friends, who never get any blame in the piece. But the piece concludes with Carl has since had counselling and is now back to playing wholesome games of cricket and revising for exams. There's also a second story featuring Ted, a 10 year old who is also addicted to Fortnite. But since the worst he ever did was swear at his mum, Ted's story was relegated to a side box. Sorry Ted, you just don't cut it kid. Now, if this article sounds like a load of exaggerated, speculative bollocks to you, you may be onto something. The piece was created by one Matthew Barber, a parasitic dog turd wrapped in human skin with a bizarre fixation of crapping on video games and a penchant for, well, enhancing the truth somewhat. Two years prior, while working on The Sun, Mr. Barber decided to write a hit piece on the evils that was Pokemon Go during the height of its popularity. Spamming blanket emails through response source, desperate to smear poor old Pikachu, and all while offering the princely sum of £100 for the best bullshit anyone could supply him. 
However, Barber's naivety of the internet is about as great as his knowledge of video games, as poor Matthew was easily led astray by trolls after that financial reward. One particular story that intrigued Barber was a yarn made by ex-Eurogamer writer and the internet's favourite 12-year-old lookalike, Chris Bratt. He spun the yarn of his wife, Jessie, was having an affair with a man named James, and the pair went hunting for Pokemon with their cat. Barber fell for it, hook, line and sinker. In fact, despite suspecting some parts were embellished, the sole reason he didn't go through with it was because he couldn't get hold of Jesse, even suggesting he'd pick the story up once again if Chris would consider splitting up from Jesse. What a complete and utter scumbag. However, the ironic thing about the Fortnite story is the Daily Mirror had a perfectly decent and respected video game journalism team working there. But thanks to Barber's sleaziness, made them the laughing stock overnight. Even one of their ex-gaming staff writers, Ryan Brown, called them out on Twitter for their utter stupidity and severe unprofessionalism on the matter. Needless to say, the story ultimately fell on deaf ears. People could smell the lies a mile off, and kids went back to their Fortnite, only to stop to play Fall Guys or Among Us or whatever the popular game is with them when you see this video. Kids are fickle like that. They don't need drugs to keep playing new games. Reporting a famous celebrity publicly screaming outcry over a hot topic is an easy way to gain some extra sales for your newspaper. But when it's one of the most popular religious leaders on the planet, now that's a license to print money. Well, it would be if you weren't a total scumbag who misled the world into assuming that. Ban Death Game Now, Pope read the headline of the February 20th, 1997 edition of the Lancashire Telegraph, and was targeting SCI's recently released PC car combat title, Carmageddon. Now, Carmageddon had already been rung through the censorship mangle multiple times, having all the humans turned into zombies with green blood in the UK version, the German version removing all living creatures entirely, replacing them with robots, and the game being banned outright in Brazil. But the tabloids having already battered the poor publisher into submission, the Evening Telegraph wanted to beat this dead horse just a little more, printing what seemed to be an exclusive quote from the head of the Catholic Church, John Paul II himself. So how did a tiny newspaper from the arse end of nowhere manage to score a world exclusive quote condemning a video game from one of the most notoriously hard to reach people on earth? They didn't. What they sneakily hid behind the attention grabbing headline was the Pope in question was actually Greg Pope, a low tier Labour MP for Hindburn, Lancashire. Obviously, they tried a few other easy targets at first, such as pulling on the heartstrings by quoting the mother of an eight-year-old who'd been hit by a car, and another Labour MP by the name of Ronnie Campbell, who promised he'd have a word with the Home Secretary about getting it banned. Spoiler alert, he didn't. They even quoted the police and some old dear who worked in a local charity shop. For some reason. But no one cared on the opinions of those people. Who else could turn heads? Well, some bright spark at the paper noticed their local MP shared the same surname as the title of a religious leader. He'd be easy to get a quote from too. I mean, working for Hinburn, he's got nothing else to do with his life. Maybe they could fool people into thinking they were one and the same. And so, with forced outrage quotes in hand, the story was put to print. Seeing all the hullabaloo, the national papers would pick up on John Paul's alleged hatred of car combat video games, more than happy to mislead their readers too. Obviously, it took no time at all for the public to notice it wasn't the papacy being outraged, but some nobody politician from the middle of nowhere, making everyone who printed the story, whether it be purposeful or not, look a bit silly and a bit scummy. 
But the paper's got some extra sales from this deceitful debasement, so a bit of self-humiliation was essentially a victory for them. However, if the goal was to ban Carmageddon, then it backfired tremendously. Rather than destroying the game's reputation, it ended up becoming one of the biggest selling PC games of 1997. Stainless released a patch to uncensor the game in the UK and Germany, even taking the BBFC to court and winning on releasing the original game uncut. The game went on to receive two sequels, ports to mobile devices, and even a remake in 2015, which itself was remade the following year. So this tale ultimately ends with everyone winning. Well, apart from Greg Pope. We'll round off this episode with one of the most damning news pieces in history, to the point that we still feel the effects from it, even to this day. In the days before the press were lambasting video games for turning kids into drug addicts and homicidal murderers, they'd become fixated on a bizarre and completely false notion that you could catch epilepsy from them. And it all stems from one article. In 1992, British teenager Jasminda Bassey was over at a friend's house playing Super Mario. Jasminda had only played the game briefly when he decided to go home. However, he would later be tragically found dead at the friend's front gate, having suffered a violent epileptic fit and choking to death on his own vomit. It's not clear whether Jasminda's parents were aware he had a history of epilepsy, but they generally considered him a strong and healthy young man. The Sun newspaper quickly picked up on the story, and looking at their article, brazenly capitalised on a grieving mother, who, despite adamantly announcing it wasn't the fault of Nintendo, but the television itself, decided it was too tempting not to use a shocking headline, Nintendo killed my son. Now, this wasn't the first article to report on the connection. After bumper sales Nintendo had the previous Christmas, several cases of epileptic fits were reported after playing on the system too, with one doctor interviewed even calling it Nintendo-itis. And despite the fact an equal number of reports had been made from Sega consoles too, the Daily Mail ran the story with the title Nintendo Face Hellstorm. So for the sun to get one up on the mail with an actual death, it was too tempting for the national paper to miss an opportunity, so pasted it across the front page of their newspaper. And, as you can guess, with such an incendiary title, the piece spread like wildfire. First to newspapers, then on to television news around the world. Overnight, parents were banning their kids from playing this newfangled computer thing across the planet, fearful it was killing their children. Sadly, despite the evidence to the contrary, very few came to Nintendo's defence, with the only true opposition to the news being British video game TV show Bad Influence, who even pulled in a member of the British Epilepsy Association to debunk the accusations. Ultimately, the whole scaremongering behind the video games give you epilepsy debate shares the same narrative as the press's video games turn you into a violent psychopath crusade. The exception proves the rule. In other words, it happened with one person, so therefore everyone must be at risk. The truth is that even if you did suffer from epilepsy, only a small number of sufferers also have photosensitive epilepsy to trigger such a state. And even in the huge unlikelihood that you do, you can instantly negate any risks of an attack by sitting in a bright room, using a smaller screen and not sitting too close, with the decisive remedy being to wear an eye patch, as the brain cannot trigger a fit if it's not receiving the same signal to both eyes. And thanks to the progression of technology, it's also far, far less likely to happen now. The whole issue started in the early 90s when everyone watched television with a CRT screen the flickering refresh rate of which was the key factor in triggering an attack. 
It's 99.9% .9 likely that the public will be using an LCD screen or better today, which refreshes images progressively, so zero flickering. Sadly, the stigma of games trigger seizures is something that Nintendo have never been able to shake off. In 2002, a mother from Louisiana attempted to sue Nintendo over the death of her 30-year-old son after he had died from hitting his head on a table from a seizure. Despite the fact he would often play for over 48 hours a week and was well aware he had a history of photosensitive epilepsy. You may also remember the story of how the first airing of the Pokemon anime in Japan caused multiple kids to be rushed to hospital from seizures. And despite no video games being involved, because it was a show from a video game, it still got the blame. And even as recent as 2008, the Sun was still banging on about the issue after the release of Mario Kart Double Dash on the GameCube. So the next time you turn on a game and are presented with an epilepsy warning, or a message telling you to take a break after an hour or so gaming, you can thank the Sun for overhyping the tragic death of a 14 year old boy. Rest in peace, Jasminda. Hello you! Thanks ever so much for watching! Be sure to subscribe to be first to see future Fact Hunt episodes. Click on the bell if you already are to make sure you're notified, and be sure to check out my other episodes. And if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon. But thanks again for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time. Ta-ra for now!